I'm sure many of you have seen this hockey stick graph. It's commonly used to communicate various issues, especially carbon. Carbon is uh, this blue line here. And what it basically shows is from the 1750s up to roughly the modern day, pretty much every major indicator is doing the same thing. This isn't just about carbon. This is about water use, it's about population growth, it's about GDP growth, foreign investment, fisheries exploitation, motor vehicles, species extinction. Pretty much every single major indicator on the planet is doing this, which is interesting because we live in a finite resource-based situation. We've got one planet, it has a certain amount of everything on it, that's all we've got. But this graph is showing a little thing called perpetual growth. Now, our illustrious leaders all believe perpetual growth is fine, it's okay. In fact, growth is good, that's the model. What's really interesting is the definition of a healthy ecosystem in biology terms is one that maintains, not one that grows. Perpetual growth is only present in a couple of things. Nature doesn't grow perpetually at all. We seem to think we can, but think about what does grow perpetually. Viruses, tumors, the human race, and that parallel is exactly there. We are behaving exactly the same as a tumor. There is a finite amount of everything in this planet. We're using it up at such a rate now, it's become insane. We only have two weeks of stored oil and food and three weeks of natural gas. We have the least backed up utility storage out of any country on the planet Earth. That means we are sitting in a just-in-time economy which has gone insane. In World War II, there was a higher degree of self-sufficiency in the UK during the U-boat sinking all the supply chains coming here than we've got now. This is the Pandora's box. We have no choice but to innovate out of this mess because this has pushed us into a place where we've never been as a species before. <coughs> but this is what we need to all be thinking about. Commodities have gone up by 147% since 2000, and 33 commodities lost 70% of their value over the course of the 20th century. In the last 10 years, they've on an average tripled. This is the basic stuff that keeps our world going. Things like chocolate, sugar, corn, coffee, on and on and on. These basic things, the volatility is starting. This is part of a huge paradigm shift. Welcome to the third industrial revolution. We're in the middle of it. This is it. Because with this volatility happening before we've even had climate change uh, hitting us at all, what do you think it's going to be like once we're honest? Once the real impacts start coming? The typhoon that hit the, uh, the Philippines? No, we can't say that was because of climate change. But what we can say is that the volatility of those storms is going to increase and their frequency will also increase. So as the more heat we add into the world systems, the more fossil fuels we burn, the more temperatures we rise, we're going to see storms like that happening on a more regular occurrence and even more powerfully. So this is going to be something that's going to become normal. Right now, we are consuming three and a half planets of resources every year. This is about balancing the books. That's what sustainability comes down to. This is not about airy fairy hair shirt sandal wearing. This is about basically surviving. This is about making it possible for us to continue, and our children, or our children's children. Now here's an assessment that was done by Accounting for Sustainability. And what it showed was the UK, sorry, the UK, the global GDP is $63,000 billion, which is $63 trillion a year. That's what the world makes in money terms. They assessed how much of the world's economy is based on natural capital, which means nature is the underlying supplier. And it's 50.8 of the 63 which is interesting because that means 81% of all the value on the planet Earth comes from nature. Only 19% comes from us. Uh, society is beginning to drive a need for environmental disclosure. We're at the beginning. Although that said, a positive, the UK is the highest purchasing of fair trade in the world. So we're light years ahead of most other countries in that regard. We have almost the highest amount per capita of charity giving in the world. So as a country, we're really far ahead in a lot of ways. Uh, company governments is a really interesting one because governments cannot micromanage the way an economy addresses all aspects of the environmental challenge. As a result, they're going to cascade out more to businesses. Businesses are going to have to do more. We've got a lot to learn, but there's a vast amount out there to teach us. In fact, the best thing in the world right now when it comes to harnessing solar power is a leaf. Those leaves outside are vastly better than we are. And you think that the amount of sunlight that hits the earth right now is somewhere around 200,000 times as much as what we produce as a species in an entire year. 
So all that energy is coming at us all the time from the sun. We only produce one two hundred thousandths of that with all of our reactors, all of our power plants, every engine, everything. So it's interesting. So what we basically need to do is have huge increases in resource efficiency. This is about factor 10, 100,000, 10,000 times improvements in efficiency. That's what we have to do because it's in our necessity to survive this. That is in the background, by the way, is the Mississippi Delta. That's some of the del deltaic land that is the first to go when the sea levels rise. That's where so many fish start their lives. <coughs> From linear to a closed loop society, we need to completely move away from the way we do business, which is to create outputs. We need to think about how those outputs inter interact with other inputs. And we need to move from fossil fuel-based economy to a solar one. Now, the UK right now is looking at a super grid. Um, this is actually a piece of work from Zero Carbon Britain, which was the first assessment in the UK to look at what it would take for us to power ourselves, water ourselves, feed ourselves, travel, transport ourselves with all of our own fuels and heat ourselves. So this is the first UK-wide assessment that is a phenomenal piece of work. And what they showed, ironically and interestingly, with a vast different combination of things, we actually can do it. If we dropped our food consumption to 85% vegetarian, which actually it's, it's the food that's the biggest piece, it's the hardest piece. Out of this whole equation, food is the most difficult thing for us to crack. But we could do it. If we all became 85% vegetarians, we actually could power ourselves. We could feed ourselves. We could water ourselves. So it's possible. And what it starts to show you, interestingly, is that biomass produces about half a megawatt per square kilometer of land. Wind, three to four. So wind is between six and eight times as energy dense as biomass. And then you look at the thing called CSP, concentrated solar power. It's up at 15. You can only do concentrated solar power in places like the south of Spain or the south of Italy or North Africa, places where it's really, really hot and sunny. But what it shows is if we mix things together, we can do this. Now, my definition of sustainability is making it easier to do good than it is to do bad. Right now, you have to work really hard to do good, and the default is to doing bad. And until we flip that on its head, the businesses and people have to do really a lot of work to do something that's bad. We're not going to have sustainability. Thank you very much. If you find this stuff interesting, uh, I've got a Sustainability Explored event series group on LinkedIn where I post all the most cutting-edge things that I find. <laughs>